students in the religious studies sector. And I'm truly delighted to have you at this presentation by Shekhar Hatangadi within the Critical Thinkers in, in Religion and Social Theory lecture series. Before I introduce our speaker, I need to express my thanks, my gratitude to two individuals in particular. First, I'd like to thank Dr. Lori Beeman, and I don't think Lori is with us today in this room, I don't think she's in Ottawa right now, but who is the Canada Research Chair in Religious Diversity and Social Change. I was interested in bringing Shekhar Hatmigadi to Ottawa, to our university, to talk about his, his work on Santara, this chain ritual fast to death. Um, in some capacity, I wanted Shekhar to come to our department, but Lori was able to make the connection between Shekhar's work which is looking again at those, those very fertile but very difficult to pin down ideas of the secular and the religious and make a link with her own work. So she sponsored this talk and she invited him to present a, a part of this lecture series. So I'm deeply grateful to her for that. Secondly, I would like to thank Dr. Heather Shipley, who certainly is here. I'm not sure if she's in the room this very <laughs> second. Um, who's also part of the Religious Diversity and Social Change Research Group on campus and who almost, I think, single-handedly runs the Critical Thinkers in Religion lecture series. Dr. Shipley certainly has been extremely involved in organizing this presentation right from get-go, which has almost been a year now, actually, so making contact with the speaker, creating the poster, organizing the room, uh, organizing the sponsorship from A to Z. Um, Heather, Dr. Shipley has been involved in that, so thank you so much, Heather, for all your tremendous efforts. Okay, so today we have um, a presentation by lawyer, law professor, journalist, and filmmaker, Dr. I mean, Mr. Shekhar Hatangadi from Mumbai, India. Shekhar is a Mumbai-based journalist, lawyer, law professor, researcher, and filmmaker who began his career as a reporter with the Times of India. He was soon appointed editor-in-chief of the Mirror magazine in Mumbai. After this, he pursued a dual or a double master's degree in international politics and journalism at Ohio University and a public policy fellowship at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. Following this, he worked in New York as an associate editor for McGraw-Hill Publications and finally returned to Mumbai to become the uh, Business Week's Mumbai correspondent. Somehow, in, uh, in the same time, Shekhar, uh, ended up getting a film studies degree and a law degree at the University of Mumbai. He has made a Hindi feature film, Teen Behene, which means three sisters, uh, which highlights the dowry deaths, dowry related deaths among unmarried girls in small town India, in Uttar Pradesh, I think, yeah, in UP. Um, he is particularly interested in making documentary films on traditional religious practices which contravene or perhaps contravene modern secular law. Um, his award-winning film called Santara, and Santara is this Jain ritual practice, the ritual fast to death, is the focus <coughs> of an uh, award-winning film that he, is, that he is showcasing throughout North America. So we're not actually seeing the film today, but if you are interested in seeing <coughs> the film, it will be shown tomorrow in Carleton University at 7 o'clock, and I can um, I'll give you the information. It's, it's uh, 303 Patterson Hall at 7 p.m. tomorrow at Carleton University. So instead, Shekhar will speak to us about his research and about the film, and um, maybe we'll, I don't know, maybe we'll see some images from it, or, or uh, we'll see how it goes. Without any further ado, I'd like to welcome our guest speaker, Shekhar Hatsingdhavi. I think so. Let's see if it works, right? Can you hear at the back with the mic? Is it okay? Can, I, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, my special thanks to uh, Dr. Anne Valeri, uh, Dr. Lori Beeman, and Dr. Heather Shepley for organizing this trip of mine to Ottawa and for hosting this particular event. I'm particularly honored to be part of this Critical Thinkers uh, in Religion series because I've, I've, I know for sure that some of the past speakers have been rather big names in uh, religious studies. Uh, I'm not a scholar of religion in the conventionally understood meaning of the word. Uh, I'm more of a a law kind of a person, uh, a legal 
researcher, a law professor, and a lawyer by training. But my interest in religion in general and in religious practice in particular uh, stems from and extends to uh, the limit to which religion and religious practice can illuminate this larger debate that countries like India, societies like India are confronting at the moment. And that is, how does a faith-based society grapple with uh, traditional religious practices which seem to contravene, as uh, Professor Valeli said, uh, modern secular law? In the pursuit of this kind of research, I have investigated several such religious practices in India. As you can imagine, India is a very fertile ground for this kind of research. Uh, because we have many religions and many more religious practices, and we have laws which uh, we've inherited from the British, who didn't quite understand our, our uh, culture. And so this, this conflict is, is very much there, this law-religion conflict. And I'm here to report on the state of the art of this religion law or law religion conflict. And let me point out right away that uh, religion, it would seem, is currently on the back foot uh, as far as this conflict is concerned. This is doubtless a very nervous time for religions in India. Uh, it's a nervous time particularly for religious orthodoxies and even more so for those revisionist ones which are trying to reinterpret ancient texts to, su to suit their narrow and questionable ends. Let me give you three examples of this, uh, of this uh, situation. Even as I speak, the police in Hyderabad, which is uh, a city in the southern Indian state uh, of uh, Telangana and the Andhra Pradesh region, are investigating the death, which happened just over a week ago, of a 13-year-old girl, school girl in fact, who died after a 68-day fast. The police are investigating whether the family of this girl persuaded, encouraged, or at the very least failed to prevent this particular kind of death. Allegedly, the family which runs a jewelry business <laughs> was spoken to by a, a monk, the spiritual family's spiritual counselor, who it seems indicated that if this girl undertook this kind of a fast, then the uh, family business would prosper. So the investigation is whether the family members and others were, in a sense, abetting or encouraging this kind of suicide. That's one instance. Uh, but I'd like to, before we move further, uh, talk to you about the same incident, which uh, is part of a news report that I received from uh, associates in India. It says, with family blessing, now this is important, with family blessing, girl fast for 68 days, dies, giants outraged. Now, there's some kind of controversy of whether this is a particular kind of fast or not. But that, for me, is not really material. That's, that's uh, the area for uh, scholars of religion. For me, the interesting part is that it was a fast, it was a death, and it has been investigated as something that could possibly be a culpable offense. If you... Um, 
highlight that particular visual or that picture which accompanies this report. Yeah, yeah, that's enough. Can you can you see uh, uh, the girl? In fact, it's the corpse of the girl that is being, I wouldn't say paraded, but being taken to its uh, to the funeral spot in a in a kind of a procession, which was a kind of celebration of her uh, of her fast and of her ultimate death, and you can see. Uh, two of her family members holding her. Uh, holding her because when uh, there is a custom in India which says that when a spiritual, spiritually elevated person passes away, uh, that person cannot be taken uh, lying on his or her back to the funeral pyre. Uh, he or she has to be uh, seated. And usually there are, there are ropes which tie you to a plank behind. Uh, in this case, either the ropes were not strong enough or uh, they were not there, but you can see a couple of her uh, family members holding on to her. I think we can stop this. This is one incident where, which tells you that uh, religion is, is having a rather nervous time in India. The police is on the case. A second instance, or a second piece of evidence. A little over a month ago, <coughs> the Bombay High Court in Mumbai lifted a ban on the entry of women into the inner sanctum of what is called the Haji Ali Darga. Uh, a Darga is a, is a shrine, is a, where the tombstone of uh, uh, Sufi saints, Sufism is a, is a, uh, a, a sect within Islam. Uh, where such saints are buried, and uh, Haji Ali is a is a is a the name of the of that particular saint, and that darga is very picturesque. It's actually uh, a little away from the coast of Bombay, and you actually have to trek through a uh, an elevated road uh, on both sides of which you have the uh, uh, Arabian Sea in order to get to that uh, darga. Now this darga was otherwise open to the public. Women were traditionally allowed inside ever since the centuries-old Darga was first built, till about four years ago, when the Darga Trust suddenly decided to impose the ban on the entry of women, claiming that Islam considers women touching the tombs of its holy men, and even the very presence of women at their tomb sites as being sinful and blasphemous. The Bombay High Court was not persuaded it uh, observed that the trust had failed to establish its claim on the basis of the verses of the Quran that it had cited to justify the ban. It also dismissed the trust's claim that the restriction was imposed to protect the women worshippers from being molested or sexually assaulted by the men visiting the Darga. A third instance, earlier this year in April 2016, the court actually had gone a step further by breaking an established traditional practice of not allowing women entry into the Hindu shrine of Lord Shani. Lord Shani is, uh, translates to Lord Saturn. Uh, in a place called Shani Shingnapur, a temple town about 300 kilometers east of Mumbai city. The temple town, by the way, is famous for being a town without locks. The townspeople believe that the powerful benediction of uh, Lord Shani protects the entire town from the acts of miscreants. And so when a state-owned and a state-run bank wanted to open a branch there with uh, safe deposit walls or boxes, you have them here, I suppose, right? uh, where you put your valuables, which would op obviously necessitate the use of locks. The people insisted that there would be no locks. The other notable characteristic of uh, Shani Shingnapur is that the sacred Chauthara or the uh, sanctum sanctorum of the shrine has been kept out of bounds for women devotees for as long as anyone can remember. This restriction was challenged <coughs> several months ago by members of an activist group called Bhumata Brigade 
who tried to storm into the sanctum, resulting in the group leader, Trupti Desai, being restrained and detained by the police. Ms. Desai then threatened to lower herself into the sanctum, which is located in an open courtyard from a helicopter with the help of ropes, but was told that she would be denied flying rights over the temple precincts. The feisty lady uh, did not have to push her case further as the temple trust, in keeping with the High Court directive, relented. Henceforth, women will, and I quote, neither be encouraged nor stopped, end quote, from entering the Chauthara, a senior temple trustee, Shani Lande, incidentally a woman, announced after the decisive trust meeting. The trust decision to allow unrestricted entry to members of both sexes was welcomed by the state chief minister, uh, which would be the Indian equivalent of the premier of a Canadian province, uh, who pledged that to the High Court that his administration would strictly enforce a law that stipulates, that stipulates a six-month jail sentence for anyone preventing a person from offering prayers at a public temple or a place of worship. As a sidelight, the trust decision was also followed by a public warning issued by a Hindu godman, complete with matted hair, rudraksha beads, and smeared with holy ash, that allowing women into the Chauthara would mean that Shani Shingnapur will now become a den of vice and criminal activity, and that rapes would be rampant across the temple town and perhaps even across the country. Well, no such dramatic development has been reported during the six months since the gender restriction was lifted. Was lifted. So one can safely say that the government's apprehension was quite unfounded. And Trupti Desai, the women's rights activist who had nursed ambitions of an aerial entry into the Shani Shingnapur shrine, has promised to take the battle to other temples in India with similar restrictions. In one of them, the battle is already ongoing. The Lord Ayappa Temple in Shabrimala is located in the southwestern Indian state of Kerala. The temple authorities have traditionally barred the entry of women between the ages of 10 and 50, so as to keep out menstruating women from the temple premises. Two stated reasons for this ban. One, that a physically arduous pilgrimage precedes the ceremonial pr proceedings at the Ayapa temple, and women would find it difficult to trek several kilometers on foot through forest areas and climb steep hills. The second reason is that Lord Ayappa is a celibate god. For the uninitiated, let me point out that Indian gods, like those in uh, Greek mythology, have human traits and failings. So the temple authorities have traditionally felt that allowing menstruating and therefore, controversial description, unclean women near the shrine would amount to a sacrilege. Well, uh, women's groups don't think so. The campaign against this line of thinking is peer-headed by a group that piquantly calls itself happy to bleed <laughs> <laughs> and has made sufficient noise about this kind of discrimination that the Supreme Court of India is now hearing a public interest litigation that, uh, on this issue. In fact, the three-judge bench of the High Court in its preliminary observations, questioned the temple board's decision to bar the entry of menstruating women, implying that it was prima facie, which means in law, it means on the face of it, a denial of their constitutional right to pray at a public shrine. Encouraged by, by such supportive utterances from the country's high-ranking judicial authorities, namely the judges of the high courts and the Supreme Court. Incidentally, we have, <coughs> unlike uh, uh, courts in uh, North America, we have only one Supreme Court for the entire nation. The highest uh, judicial authority in a, or a tribunal in a state or a province uh, would be the High Court. Here you have, I think, Supreme Court, which is the highest authority. In India, it's the High Court. So the judges of the High Court and the judges of the Supreme Court are both considered, quote unquote, the higher judiciary. So, Support, encouraged by supportive utterances from these uh, members of the higher judiciary, women in India are now pressing for equal status 
in various other spheres of personal law, which so far have remained untouched in deference to religious tradition. Among them are practices such as polygamy, talaq e biddat, and nikah halala, which are unconstitutional according to a petition filed by a Muslim woman from West Bengal state and ad admitted in late August this year by the Supreme Court. Under the Muslim law in India, prevalent in India, a Muslim man can have up to four wives at the same time. But the corresponding practice of polyandry, that is allowing a Muslim woman similar rights, is not permitted. The divorce laws in Islamic jurisprudence are similarly one-sided. A Muslim man can simply utter the word talaq which in Arabic means, I divorce you, three times to his wife, and the marriage is effectively null and void. That's called talaqe biddat. The corresponding right of the wife to initiate divorce proceedings, called khula, is much more cumbersome to exercise, and certainly not as summarily effected as the talaqe biddat. An Indian court was faced with an intriguing case some years ago. A Muslim man came home one evening after downing a few drinks, or maybe more than a few drinks, and in that inebriated state, picked up a quarry with his wife, which escalated to the point where he pronounced triple talaq and went off to sleep. The next morning, he was remorseful and wanted his conjugal privileges back. <laughs> the village elders held a meeting and pronounced that the talaq would hold and the couple would be socially ostracized if they continued living together. The divorced wife, however, was shown an escape clause, namely nikah halala. She could marry and re reunite with her husband, but for that to happen, she would first have to find another man to marry, consummate that marriage, divorce him or get him to divorce her as per the stipulated rules, and then remarry her first husband. The wife apparently thought this was too much work <laughs> and, and sought an opinion of the Supreme Court which held that such inebriated talaks were not valid. The majority of the cases I've cited so far seem relatively straightforward in that they are seen as instances of blatant gender discrimination trying to hide behind the fig leaf of so-called religious tradition. The Santhara case, which has been viewed by activists as well as by at least one high court in India as quote-unquote religious suicide, and which is the primary reference point of this talk, is comparatively more complex and nuanced. <coughs> the courts in this case are, or at least should be, looking at a multi-layered, multi-faceted issue involving religious freedom and tradition, individual rights of self-determination and privacy, a minority community's right to preserve what it considers to be an integral part of its distinct and unique culture, the circumstances in which an avowedly secular state would be obligated to intervene in matters of religion, and so on. All of which are not only legal rights in India, but also fundamental rights which fall within the ambit of the Indian constitution. And the challenge for the country's highest judicial tribunal now is to weigh these rights in the scales of reformative justice against what it regards as the principal objectives of a social and public welfare state. But before we look more closely at the Santhara case and its salient features, and before I answer an even more basic question, namely, what is Santhara and why is it under a legal cloud? Let us recognize an important fact of modern history. And the fact to which I alluded earlier is that particularly in societies which remain largely faith-based, despite their outer trappings of profane modernity, and whose government simultaneously aspire to the committee of secular nation states, the interface of governance and religion is fraught with tensions caused by the friction between the imperatives of traditional religious practices and the essential legal and constitutional principles of a secular democratic polity. In India, 
the incompatibility, com compatibility between law and religious orthodoxy has manifested in several forms. Restricted entry into temples and their sanctum sanctorums, raising issues of equal treatment and gender discrimination, which I mentioned earlier. Induction of minors into cadres of monks and nuns known as Baal Diksha. Baal means child, Diksha means renunciation. And challenged by activists as violative of child rights. The orthodox prohibition in some religions, most not notably Zoroastrianism, against organ donation, the use of wine in church rituals in the face of state-imposed prohibition, among others. But it is without a doubt most dramatically apparent in the case of what have come to be known as religious suicides, typically where a religious or sectarian tradition endorses the self-extinguishment of a human life as they occur, as these incidents occur in a legal system that treats suicide as a criminal offense. Let me tell you a little about Santhara. Santhara is often also referred to as Salekhana. It's a religious practice, a traditional religious practice among Jains. Jainism is an ancient Indian religion. Some people believe it's an offshoot or a breakaway from Hinduism, but the Jains are pretty clear that theirs is a dis distinct religion on its, you know, on its, of its own right and uh, <coughs> should not be confused with Hinduism, although some of the tenets kind of overlap. Uh, there are three basic tenets of Jainism that you would need to know uh, to know what uh, Jainism really is. And the three basic tenets are Ahimsa, which is non-violence, Aparigriha, which is a kind of detachment from worldly uh, objects and desires. And third is called Anekantvada, which is an openness and an inclusive approach to uh, differing views. And even if they are contrary to your own, you know, this is the kind of inclusiveness that uh, Jainism preaches. So basically, these are the three tenets of Jainism. And ever since the current tenets of Jainism were established around 4000 BC, oh, sorry, 400 BC, thousands of its followers down the ages have embraced this particular feature, that is the fast into death which is considered the high point of Ahimsa or of religious, Jain religious orthodoxy. The antiquity of this practice and its religious significance notwithstanding, Santhara today finds itself within the crosshairs of a campaign by activists to abolish this practice for its alleged abuses. One such activist, his name is Nikhil Soni, he is now a Jaipur Rajasthan-based lawyer, hails originally from what is known as the Churu, C-H-U-R-U, Churu district of the northwestern Indian state of Rajasthan. The district has acquired the dubious reputation of being the world's Santhara capital for its highest per capita incidence of this practice in recent history. Growing up in Churu, Sony was for years a mute witness to several such ceremonial fasts unto death till 2006. That year, after the police failed to prevent an elderly woman's demise through Santara, Sony filed a writ petition against the practice in the Rajasthan High Court, calling it, quote unquote, a social evil that should be deemed as an act of suicide and therefore illegal under Indian law. His petition demands that the practitioners of Santhara should be prosecuted under section 309 of the Indian Penal Code, which is the section for attempt to commit suicide, and that supporters who encourage it by venerating them as spiritually elevated beings should be charged with abetting a crime. Well, the battle lines were clearly drawn once the petition was filed. If Sony's petition evoked the right to life enshrined in Article 21 of the Indian Constitution. The Santhara advocates turned the tables by positing its very corollary 
the right to life according to this argument is meaningless without the corresponding right to stop living that is the right to die the same article that is article 21 they underline also grants a person the right to personal liberty in such matters their defense bolstered considerably by the active support of the retired High Court Judge Panach and Jain, further sought the protection of at least three constitutional provisions as well as the endorsement of an international covenant. I'll, I'll leave out those, uh, the details of those constitutional provisions. But suffice it to say that all of the above collided head-on with the very citadel of India's highest judiciary. If the Santhana apologists and followers had the country's primary statute book and an international covenant apparently on their side, Nikhil Soni had the weight of judicial opinion firmly in his favor. And that opinion was the judgment of a five-judge bench of the Supreme Court, which ruled in Gyan Kaur versus State of Punjab. It's a 1996 judgment, and people who are interested in, in this topic should refer to this. Uh, it's out there on the, on the internet. Gyan Kaur, G-I-A-N-K-A-U-R, Gyan Kaur versus State of Punjab, in which the Supreme Court said that the right to life is a natural right embodied in Article 21, but suicide is an unnatural termination or extinct, extinction of life and therefore incompatible and inconsistent with the concept of right to life. Emphasizing the sanctity of human life, the court was categorical, and I quote, by no stretch of imagination can extinction of life be read to be included in protection of life, end quote. In August 2015, nearly a decade after the petition against Santhara was first filed, the Jaipur bench of the Rajasthan High Court ruled on the Santhara case. It held that the practice would henceforth be treated as suicide and made punishable under Section 309, which is the attempt to commit suicide, and under Section 306, abetment of suicide of the Indian Penal Code. It pointed out that the overriding and governing principles of public order, public morality, and public health condition the right to freedom of conscience and the right to freely profess, practice, and propagate religion. It is directive to the state that the latter shall stop and abolish the practice in any form and register any complaint against it as a criminal case. The court made its rejection of the joint philosophy underlying the practice unequivocally clear. It also unwittingly bared the cultural divide between disparate life, end of life concepts. During the five year long research for my documentary film on this controversy, which you can see tomorrow, and it's called Santhara, a challenge to Indian secularism. I met with several members of the Jain clergy and other lay adherents of the faith, as well as scholars who had studied the philosophy of Jainism through its scriptures and its rituals. Without an exception, they were all at pains to point out the fallacy of characterizing Santhara as a form of suicide. True, both acts culminate in the self-extinguishment of a human life, but the motivations of the actors are poles apart. Whereas suicide is an act of extreme desperation, fueled by anguish and hopelessness. A Santhara practitioner, relinquishing food and drink voluntarily by this method, has arrived at that decision after calm and unruffled introspection, with an intent to cleanse oneself of karmic encumbrances, and thus it is, sorry, and thus attain the highest state of transcendental well-being. Santhara for him or her is therefore simply an act of spiritual purification premised on an exercise of individual autonomy. Admittedly, dietary abstinence as religious ritual isn't unique to Jainism. There is Ramzan among Muslims, Lent among Christians, fasting during Yom Kippur, yeah? happened just uh, a few days ago, uh, and Tisha B'Av among Jews, and a host of astronomy and astrology related fasts among Hindus. But none of the others 
takes fasting to the point of starvation and ultimately death, as does Santhara. Since any kind of eating or drinking would result in a disruption, however, min however minimal, of the natural ecology around them, and add a burden, however small, to that same ecology, orthodox Jains consider zero consumption, that is fasting unto death as in Santara, to be the high point among the Jain traditions of austerity and self-denial, and therefore the truest real-world act of ahimsa, or non-violence, the fundamental tenet of Jainism. Now disregard for a moment the radical extremism of the act itself and contrast its broader theological rationale which more or less is common to Eastern religions and which resonates nicely with the basic theory of karma that undergirds the beliefs and practices of most ancient religions on one side with the ecclesiastical values prevalent in the cultures that spawned the forms of governance we Indians presently live with. And if you compare these two, you will realize that a conspiracy of history, circumstance, and expedient decision making has resulted in our law making and law administering bodies being structured on the Westminster model of our colonial rulers, not to mention their judicial machinery, which was first put in place by the British and our key statutes, notably our criminal laws, remaining largely untouched since the time they were first written with their colonial feather pens. Even the bulk of our constitution, which was mulled over and drafted by what is called the Constituent Assembly on the cusp of our independence, and which was a brainchild, was a brainchild and handiwork of the British because the majority of it, about 85% of it, derives from the Government of India Act in 1935, which was a British Act. And arguably, its most important articles, namely those enshrining our fundamental rights, were inspired by the American Constitution. Now, the concept of suicide associated with religion is a repugnant one for the mainstream Anglo-Saxon West, whose Judaic Christian beliefs would denounce such an act as antithetical to the moral and ethical principles espoused by Christianity. The systematic codification of Indian criminal law as we know it today began soon after the colonialists survived the blood-soaked mutiny of 1857, which is called the first independence movement of India, the second one being in 1947, by which we got our independence. So the, the, soon after the colonialists survived the blood-soaked mutiny of 1857, and after they formally established the British Raj, the Indian Penal Code, or IPC, came into force. It forms the bulk of our criminal jurisprudence, bears an 1860, 1860 vintage, of course it came into force a couple of years later, and was drafted by a certain Lord Thomas Macaulay, who was known to be a devout Christian. Inevitably, it would appear the wily administrator put forth a code that not only set a low threshold of culpability for political dissent and for spreading disaffection against the government, which interestingly was tacitly welcomed by successive regimes well into the post-independence era, and which is why it's still so easy in India to slap sedition cases against innocuous writers and cartoonists. This code also reflected his deeply held moral and ethical convictions about right and wrong, good and evil. The crown couldn't have found a more faithful and capable servant. As a public policy maker, Macaulay had telescoped his personal beliefs into an official document that upheld the so-called civilizing mission of his masters while taking care of the everyday chore of maintaining law and order among unruly natives, as well as the tri tricky task of subverting their pagan values. The IPC established the first requirement of maintaining law and order, and Mac Macaulay's introduction of English as a medium of instruction in schools and colleges contributed to the second. It paved the way for Christian missionaries to press forward with their religious conversions among the needy and with their so-called convent education among the aspiring middle classes. From this large-scale 
acculturation emerged a new generation of brown sahibs or babus as they are derisively called bureaucrats and other administrative personnel eminently qualified to maintain the institutions of the british raj but it also set the ball rolling for a fundamental and deep seated albeit sel seldom articulated discordance between the western ideologies that created those institutions and devised their operating norms and procedures and the eastern philosophies that shaped the world view of the people those institutions were meant to serve instead of the earth the meek religions of the subcontinent have thus inherited an ill fitting legal template forged so to speak in the smithies of the west and the santara case serves to emphasize the seemingly irreconcilable difference in perspective on the specific issue of suicide unlike a christian believer who looks upon the human body as a god god given temple of the human soul and therefore beyond the realm of willful and deliberate destruction by any human being a devout jain views that same body as a prison of the human soul the fulfillment of whose needs corresponds to the accumulation of bad karma this basic contradiction between a statute founded largely on a christian inspired bioethic and the essentially eastern variant of the idea of spiritual advancement through abstinence and renunciation rears its head whenever an ancient religious practice like santhara collides with contemporary law the conflict be conflict becomes particularly glaring in a faith -based, faith based society like ours whose polity has embraced forms of governance and administration that are transplants from an alien soil which raises the question are countries such as those in europe and north america which enforce a rather strict separation between religion and governance and which discourage public displays of religious festivity faring any better having painstakingly achieved the ideal of the church state divide through centuries of struggle these countries are apt to look askans particularly at the indian nation state where a government that calls itself secular regulates re religious institutions subsidizes hajj trips and deploys state resources to safeguard amarnath yatra pilgrims but times might be changing although the conventional mainstream idea of secularism in western democracies <laughs> Ted, can you turn the projector off just to be fair yes we sure <laughs> thank you thank you <laughs> Although the conventional mainstream idea of secularism in western democracies largely keeps religion out of governance the influx of immigrants of various faiths into these countries in recent times and their assertive even militant stance with regard to the rights of religious practice has made these countries confront the problem anew the spiking issues of burqa wearing in france the wearing or not wearing of hijabs and niqabs in canadian court rooms and of circumcision in germany manifest the same law religion conflict with which we are grappling in india the unease over santhara may well be part of a global discontent closer home however several questions await an answer or at least a serious consideration when one contextualizes religion or religious practices such as santhara in the realm of constitutional secularism should india revisit the constituent assembly debates on the subject the constituent assembly debates <coughs> generated the indian constitution and should we explore in greater detail what scientist kt shah demanded namely that the constitution should contain an express provision that would prevent the state from having any concern whatsoever with any religion creed or profession of faith or do we accommodate in even greater measure the sentiments of the likes of the hindu nationalists k k munshi who wanted the state in its policy making functions to take into account the deeply religious moorings quote deeply religious moorings of the indian pe people particularly of the hindu majority or shall we continue 
living with and bumbling our way through what has come to be termed as our constitutional anomalies, namely caste-based reservations and religion-based personal laws. These are questions that cannot be wished away or even left festering for too long without the risk of endangering society peace and harmony. In fact, the questions themselves and the debates they spawn form the basis of our ongoing national struggle of reconciling diverse religious beliefs with our acceptance of the concept of a secular state. <coughs> now that the Rajasthan High Court has pronounced against Santhara, and that judgment has been appealed against in the Supreme Court of India, the question uppermost in everyone's mind is how will the latter, that is the Supreme Court, approach the Santhara case? It has, in my opinion, at least a couple of options. The first option would be to take into consideration the works of scholars who have researched and deliberated on the evolving concept of Indian constitutional secularism. It is instructive to note that both the words secular and socialist were not part of the original version of the Indian constitution which came into force in 1950. Significantly, they were added, both added, more than a quarter century later in 1976, when it became clear that the Indian variants of socialism and secularism were differently and even uniquely configured as compared to those of other countries. Just as Indian socialism factored in elements of first world capitalism and second world social, state socialism to create what is called a mixed economy that has survived the tweaking of successive administrations, Indian secularism, too, is a breed in and by itself. It has steered clear of the Western, that is the European and American model, of the absolute separation of church and state, <coughs> given how pervasively India's secular life is entangled with its religions. And on the other hand, it has shunned the other extreme of the theocratic state model, given its commitment to the welfare of its religious minorities. Against this backdrop, constitutional scholars and experts have over the years developed two sets of normative principles which could help determine the propriety and extent of state intervention in matters concerning religion. These approaches are not mutually exclusive, much less antithetical, as will be clear as I unpack their characteristics. The first, the first set <coughs> sorry, <coughs> is a kind of checklist of values which every act of state intervention should adhere. And the values are, A, religious freedom, and included here are not just religious beliefs, but also rituals, practices, and other rites and ceremonies associated with religion. B, celebratory neutrality, which would mandate that the state encourages and even assists financially and in other ways the celebration of all faiths, and C, reformative justice, entailing state-affected reforms and regulations of religious institutions and practices. The other complementary approach is called the principal distance doctrine. This doctrine is premised on the idea that a state that calls itself secular and that has secular ends and that is institutionally separated from a religious entity like the church must engage with religion at the law of level and social public policy. This engagement, of course, must be governed by principles undergirding a secular state, that is the principles that flow from a commitment to the values that I mentioned above. The state must therefore engage with religion or disengage from it, engage positively or negatively, but it does so depending entirely on whether or not these values are promoted or undermined by its intervention or its non-intervention. A state that intervenes or refrains from intervening on this basis keeps what is called a principal distance from all religions. This approach is a little akin to the concept of equitable treatment versus equal treatment. Differently put, the doctrine of principal distance calls for a flexible approach 
to state intervention in the religious life of its people. Aiming at inter-religious and intra-religious domination, and thus uh, aiming at reducing inter-religious and intra-religious domination, and thus fostering communal harmony, the state could, depending on the context of the situation, either abstain from intervening or choose to intervene in any matter concerning religion. If the latter, that is if it chooses to intervene, it could intervene positively, for example, by helping adherents of a religion to participate more fully in their traditions, as in the case of the Indian government subsidizing Hajj trips of economically challenged Indian Muslims. Or it could intervene negatively to curtail discriminatory practices, as in the Indian courts allowing Muslims to adopt children in the face of the All India Muslim Personal Law Board. Till 2014, just about two years ago, Indian Muslims only had the power of guardianship in, one, in which one possesses only the legal right on the child till he or she turns an adult. The biological parents have a right to intervene during that period. Now, adopting parents become natural parents and the child too gets all the rights of a naturally born child, including the right to inherent property. So that was an example of the principled distance doctrine at work. And that, according to me, is one option before the Supreme Court, namely to listen to what scholars and experts have thought through and arrived at, and to use that template to evaluate the validity of the Santara practice and to determine its continuance in a regulated or an unregulated form. The other option is the lazy option. The Supreme Court could merely choose to view its own Gyanko ruling as a binding precedent, and on that basis, as well as on the Rajasthan High Court ruling, which effectively backed the petitioner's contentions equating the practice with suicide, outlaw Santhara for good. In so doing, it will have overlooked an important fact, and that is that this Gyan Kaur case involved an act of abetment of suicide or mercy killing, not an act linked to the observance of a religious practice. And by insisting on viewing a transcendental spiritual philosophy through the lens of a dark criminal act like suicide, the court will have seriously dented the religious sensi sensitivities of nearly 7 million practicing giants worldwide, more than 100